This is a Frontlines Update, Flashpoint, Kurdistan. In June 2014, some 2,000 well-armed radical Islamists charged out of Syria into Iraq. The Iraqi army, weakened by the Obama administration's ill-advised removal of all U.S. combat units, collapsed before the onslaught. More than 10,000 Iraqi soldiers abandoned billions of dollars worth of U.S.-provided tanks, armored vehicles, and fled for their lives. It took ISIS just four days to capture Mosul, the second largest city in Mesopotamia. By 29 June 2014, when Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi proclaimed himself to be caliph of the Islamic State, the only forces in Iraq capable of opposing the ISIS army were Kurdish Peshmerga soldiers. Since then, our Frontlines team has been reporting to you on what's been happening in this very troubled part of the world and letting you know why it's important to every American. We showed you the Obama legacy, tens of thousands of Christian, Yazidi, and Iraqi dead and wounded, and the greatest refugee crisis since World War II. For more than three years, our Frontlines team has traveled the region, reporting on how the Kurds, inadequately supplied by the Shiite government in Baghdad, were fighting a barbaric enemy. During the fight to liberate ISIS-held territory, we reported from Mount Sinjar, near the Syrian border, all the way to the eastern border near Iran, showing the cruel atrocities committed by suicidal ISIS jihadis and the bravery of the Kurdish Peshmerga. This enemy is my enemy and your enemy. If you see the reality of this war, yeah, it's very difficult, but we are very powerful in the heart. Our Frontlines reports explain how ISIS is an enemy that wants the world to live in the seventh century, but uses drones to guide suicide trucks to their targets and employs the internet to spew forth its propaganda and recruit adherents. We've been to refugee camps in the region and in Europe, where millions of desperate civilians sought safety from the horror inflicted by ISIS. Our cameras documented how the U.S. military brave American individuals, humanitarian organizations, and the people of Kurdistan helped ease the desperate plight of those fleeing ISIS terror. In the autumn of 2016, when U.S. trained and equipped Iraqi special ops forces began the bloody offensive to liberate Mosul from ISIS, we were there. And we showed you a sinister underreported activity, the presence of Iranian-directed and supported paramilitary organizations. In Kurdistan, the inauguration of President Donald Trump was met with exultation. His decision to relax Obama-era rules of engagement and allow U.S. advisors and combat air controllers to accompany frontline combat units saved lives and expedited the defeat of ISIS in Iraq and in Syria. On 9 July 2017, over three years after ISIS seized Mosul, Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi arrived in Mosul to proclaim the city liberated. Despite this victory, small pockets of suicidal ISIS jihadis are still a threat, just as Kurdish leaders predicted. We think we can defeat ISIS military-wise here, but ISIS will stay as a threat. ISIS is not only a military force, ISIS is a huge, big ideological force. So once has been defeated, that doesn't mean they are not coming back. Since Mosul was freed from ISIS, here's what's happened. On 25 September 2017, 93% of the Kurds in northern Iraq voted in a plebiscite for independence from Baghdad. When our Frontlines team interviewed Masoud Barzani, president of the Kurdish regional government in November 2016, he gave us a map showing an independent Kurdistan. This is the map on which he drew a red line showing the boundaries of Kurdistan. It's the line in which the Peshmerga had a berm and trench line built against ISIS. We showed it to you in our reports. This map clearly shows Mosul is not part of Kurdistan, but oil-rich Kirkuk is. And so are other territories like Mount Sinjar that were protected or recaptured by Kurdish Peshmerga troops after being seized by ISIS. Every Kurdish official with whom we spoke about a future Kurdistan acknowledged a final Kurdistan-Iraq border would be determined by negotiations with Baghdad. Apparently, that didn't matter to the al government in Baghdad or 
in Tehran. Within 24 hours of the vote, the Baghdad government shut down all commercial air traffic to or from Erbil, the Kurdish capital. Then, on the night of 16, 17 October, three weeks after the Kurds' overwhelming vote for independence, Iraqi army units, trained, armed, and equipped by the U.S., and accompanied by Iranian-led provisional military units, moved against the Kurds in oil-rich Kirkuk. In less than 48 hours, Iraqi troops and their Iranian-supported allies seized control of Kirkuk and its oil fields reportedly killing more than 50 Peshmerga fighters in the process. Ironically, on that same night, American trained, equipped, and advised Free Syrian Army forces, predominantly Kurds, liberated Raqqa, the last ISIS stronghold in Syria. In the midst of these seemingly surreal developments, the Trump administration, apparently blindsided by our intelligence agencies and our State Department, announced it was remaining neutral in the dispute between the Kurds in Erbil and the Iranian-backed government in Baghdad. On 20 October, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson arrived in the region on a damage control mission, though it didn't work. On Sunday, 22 October, after two meetings with Iraqi Prime Minister al-Abadi and pleading for Iranian-supported militias to, quote, go home, the Iraqi leader rejected U.S. entreaties and said, Iranian-led paramilitary units were, and I quote, the hope of our country and the region. And despite the American blood and treasure expended in his country, Alabadi added, no party has the right to interfere in Iraqi matters. Well, in short, this means, with ISIS all but eliminated, the Ayatollahs in Tehran are now calling the shots in Iraq. The Iranians are desperate to keep a secure land quarter from Tehran to support their ally Bashir al-Assad in Damascus and their Hezbollah puppets in Lebanon. They're winning what they wanted all along, a secure land route from Tehran through Iraq to Syria and Lebanon. And then there's the elephant in the closet, Vladimir Putin. He wants to keep Assad in power so Russia can retain their Syrian military bases in Tartus and Latakia. So what does all this mean for the United States? Well, just suppose that Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Islamist president of Turkey, presently dancing with the devils in Moscow and Tehran, decides he wants to withdraw Turkey from NATO and close the big NATO air base at Incirlik. Well, until we abandoned the Kurds, they were willing to give us full access to bases that we'd built to support them against Saddam Hussein. All this begs the question, what is the future? for Kurdistan. From the front lines of freedom, I'm Oliver North on NRA TV.